And with that, I will turn it over to Michael Druckmann. Thank you, Rainsford, and thank you all for joining us for our 16th annual forum session titled, What Role Can Career Pathways Play in Schools? This is such an important topic, particularly in the rapidly changing world we're living in. This is part of an ongoing conversation that started in January with a memorable session on is post-secondary ready for revolutionary change. Then last month, we continued this conversation with a session on is college a right, a luxury, or another option? And today we extend this meaningful discourse looking at the role of career pathways in schools. This will be followed at three o'clock with asking is high school models ready for, uh, is the high school model ready for revolutionary change? We're so fortunate to have a dream team panel of outstanding school leaders from four different cities who are realizing extraordinary results at the high school and middle school levels. What a unique opportunity to hear from some of the best K-12 school leaders of our time talking about such a relevant topic. We're also honored to have a moderator, Julia Freeland Fisher, Director of Education at the Clayton Christensen Institute. A number of years ago, Clayton spoke at our forum in Boston. I can attest to the fact that Julia exemplifies his legacy for commitment to research and innovation in her work. Julia spoke brilliantly at last year's forum on the importance of social capital. It's a great pleasure to welcome her back, this time as moderator of today's very engaging discussion. Julia, welcome back. Thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate the warm introduction. I got a little choked up there thinking about Clay, so appreciate that. Um, wonderful to be here with all of you. We have three amazing panelists here and a fourth joining on the way. This is what happens when you convene uh, school leaders in the middle of a day. You never know what might come up on their end. So um, we'll sort of roll with it. But I'm, I'm really excited about today's topic. And we're going to kind of get under the hood of the jargony term of career pathways. It means many things to many people. But like Michael said, we have some really cutting edge innovators that I think can bring both clarity and discipline to, to what a high quality um, and innovative career pathway looks like. So to start us off, I could read really impressive biographies of each of the individuals that we have here. But I'm actually going to let them share a little bit about themselves. And what, I, what I'd ask um, of, of each of you, Rashid, Fee, and Greg, is if you can share not only who you are, where you work, but a bit more about um, either an experience or an individual that helped you launch your career as a leader in education. Just again, to think about our own pathways that got us where we are and how we can design those for more students. Um, so Rashid, can you start us off? Okay, sure, thank you for having me. Um, Rashid Farad Davis, the founding principal of Pathways and Technology Early College High School, um, located in Central Brooklyn. And what really got me inspired about education, I've always loved learning, but I went to a five-year high school that started in grade eight in Jasper County, South Carolina. And there were two towns, Ridgeland and Hardyville. And by my 11th grade year, we actually merged um, the two towns into a new high school. So I had a five-year high school experience two different high schools within those five years, advanced placement, more than 10 black male teachers, two black male principals, black male guidance counselors, a black male superintendent. And so by the time I went to Morehouse College, it was very clear that I was on the path to work in a field um, to, to try to help people be better. And education is that vehicle for me. Wonderful, thank you for sharing. And we're gonna dig more into the, the P-TECH model and everything that you've pioneered since really starting out with 100 students in a building and now being a really global enterprise. Um, we'll go to Fee next. Uh, Fee, share a little bit about who you are and kind of what launched you on this pathway. Sure. Hi, I'm Fee McKinnon and I am the head of school at MC Squared STEM High School. Um, we are entering our 13th year uh, next year, so that's very exciting for us. Um, and I've been a member of the MC Squared STEM High School team and family since we launched. I started off as an English teacher. Um, my inspiration is a little bit closer to home. Um, my sister actually raised me uh, from the time I was born. She's only 10 years older than me. So she's basically my 10 year old mom. Um, so everything that she did, I kind of followed in her pathway. Um, I'm a lifelong Clevelander and I grew up going through the Cleveland public school system. 
Um, for a long time, we were uh, the poorest city in the US and uh, we had a graduation rate of only 33% at the point that I was in high school. Um, so I've been a strong uh, advocate for Cleveland and the Cleveland development here in our city. Um, and now we're approaching that 80% graduation rate as a district and our school is holding steady at 100% graduation rate every year. Um, and I'm there to help every student figure out what is the next step. Um, and for some that's college, but not for everybody. So we don't wanna discount anyone's ideas. And that's what brought me here. Awesome, thank you for sharing Fee. And Greg, if you can round us out. Sure, Greg White, uh, I'm the CEO of Learn Charter School Network in Chicago. We have soon to be 11 schools pre-K through eight, about 4,200 students. 98% um, are African-American and Latinx. Um, about 90% free reduced lunch. Um, but my, my, I, I love the question. I was thought about it, but I think the person who kicked off my career in education was a woman named Ms. Bessie W. Wilson. She was superintendent of the education of a Sunday school in Perkins Square Baptist Church in Baltimore. And she sounded early in my, she said, Greg, I was probably about 11, 12 years old. You're going to be my successor. You will, her dream for me was to one day be the superintendent of the Sunday school at the Perkins Square Baptist Church in Baltimore. And why is that important? One, she was clear. It's high expectations, right? That she noticed something about me, decided I had some, some leadership qualities. I had no idea I was 11 years old, but she voiced that. She made it clear. Two, she also made it clear that educators were, were revered and deeply respected, right? Um, again, I had a, in my life, had a, had a adult who had a vision for my future, um, and just you know, and, and pre now, I did not become a superintendent. Son, I, I live in Chicago, so I did not, I, didn't, I did not become her successor. But I do think she would be proud of me because I, but I do lead and, and, and I'm an educator. Um, so hopefully, I wasn't a, a, a disappointment to her over long. Oh, I highly doubt it. I love that story. And I think what all of you just shared, you know, M M Michael shared at the beginning, introducing me that my own research focuses on the role of social capital and access to opportunity and our vision of our possible future selves as we're growing up. And I think all of you uh, provided a testament to that. So let's get into uh, how to make sure that more students have access to many visions of their future possible selves um, in how we design career pathways. So like I said, I'm a little bit wary of jargon in education and career pathways is having a little bit of a jargon moment, right? Everyone is saying that they're important and it's such a broad term that I worry as a researcher that we're not being clear about the destination of these pathways and therefore anything can count as a pathway. Um, so I'd love to ask you guys two questions and I want each of you to share because uh, you really do come at this work from a diverse set of perspectives. One is, um, are there sort of non-negotiables of what makes for a high quality career pathway so that listeners can kind of think about, okay, am I, am I doing those things when I say I'm trying to build towards a career pathway? And the second is to center equity in this conversation. If career pathways are actually going to be engines for social and economic mobility for those students who have been left out of the opportunity equation, again, are there non-negotiables? Are there things that you've observed in your years of practice that really better ensure that um, career pathways are built for all and not just some. Um, so I'm actually gonna start with you, Greg, because uh, among our panelists, you work with the youngest cohorts of students in a, in a K-8 uh, setting. And I'd love to hear about your reflections on, on career pathways for our younger learners. Sure. Um, make sure I answer your question. The, um, I just think that the, uh, the non-negotiables, I think it's, it's is not just to sort of inspire them, or just, but also they, they've got to believe that, that I can do this, right? Our view is they need to see it as much as possible and believe that I, not just as a good career, but this is something I can do. Uh, so for example, um, at LEARN, we're very, we're very conscious of, we're very proud of the fact that, um, you know, that four of our five C-level executives, our, our, C, uh, our chief financial officer, chief talent officer, me, the CEO, look like our kids, right? So the kids see it. And we're in the building, by the way. We actually operate in the school buildings. So they see it. 80% of my principals are African-American or Latinx. So they see people in leadership positions. They, they see that what's possible. And I can do this. And, and our teachers, 60% are African-American or Latinx. Um, so I think part of it is not just 
exposing them, having a career day, and that other, that they say, you know, people I, I interact with on a daily basis is possible for me. Uh, so one part of the non-negotiables is, is not just telling people, but showing people, correct? Not just telling your kids what's possible, but showing them that it is incredibly possible. That's been a big part of our philosophy. Really helpful. And I think it echoes what we heard in some of your stories as well. Greg, we'll get back to, to some of the more kind of design decisions that you've made at Learn, but curious to hear um, from Fee next, some non-negotiables as, as MC Squared has really pioneered new pathways for your students. Sure. Um, so I think when we're talking about non-negotiables, when it comes to career pathways, um, I, I operate the way I operate in life, which is following the rules of improv um, is you always say yes and you always say yes and. So if anyone presents a good idea to me, um, my initial reaction is always to say yes to something and try to add to the conversation. Uh, this is important when we're talking about career pathways because the careers that exist now are not the careers that existed when I was in high school and they're not gonna be the careers that exist you know, 20 years from now. So you have to really be open to exploring all career opportunities as viable options. Uh, even if someone comes to you and says something that you consider to be personally outlandish, like a new one for me was, you know, five years ago, everybody started telling me they wanted to be a social media influencer. And I giggled at that. And I said, no, people don't make money that way. Um, but you know, I had to say yes and, and I had to approach it that way and then think about if this is really a career pathway you wanna pursue, how am I going to get you there and how am I going to make you a contributing member of society? Um, so my non-negotiable is you gotta say yes to everything and add to the conversation. Um, and then your second part of your question was about equity. And I think that is really important as well. And it leads right into that. So not only do I personally say yes to most ideas, I teach the students to do that as well. Um, and from an equity standpoint, I think it's really important to note that while I'm doing the work on the high school level and I'm doing the work in my community with a very specific age group, um, those who are pursuing careers and those who are pursuing college, uh, it is still by and large a very traditional field when you're going the college route. So um, teaching the students uh, to kind of approach it by saying yes to the structures that exist and then kind of almost the Sun Tzu know your enemy uh, philosophy where you gotta get in there and you have to change it from the inside and um, create a more equitable environment uh, as part of it rather than from the outside. So arming them to sort of make it in an unjust world and also change that world as they go. Awesome, really helpful. Um, Rashid. Yes. So um, for P-TECH, we're the intersection of high school, college and industry with the students having the opportunity to earn a free STEM Associate in Applied Science, which the Associate in Applied Science is a degree that's recognized by industry. And it's a non-negotiable to think that as the educators, we could just exist in isolation. So our model has a liaison from industry in the school, a liaison from college in the school. So that way the day-to-day -day, um, operations is disrupted. And so we are talking about early access to mentors, early access to the skills that are needed to be successful in college. So that way you're constantly building and constantly giving all students really the opportunity to continue learning and to understand that they will always be reinventing themselves. Um, we're equity in action because it's no academic screening, no test for admissions and giving every student really the opportunity to interact with mentors, to go to job shadow, opportunities. They do compete for competitive skills-based internships, um, but they get all of that definitely before going into their senior year. So if you really are successful, you could very easily have a year's worth of college already under your belt, plus a skills-based paid internship. Our industry partner is IBM. And so when you give students a taste of not only making money, but making money from skills, 
they understand why learning matters, why then the dots need to be connected to the critical thinking and analytical skills that come from STEM majors and computer sciences, which our two pathways really deal with. Great, I think super helpful in that one point I just wanna pull out that Rashid just called out is that one of the trends we're seeing is that career pathways are gaining traction, but they're reserved for some students, right? And that I think is a real trap in the equity conversation that you're not paying attention to. It's just the students who are academically accelerated or have the leeway to do independent study who are accessing internships, mentors, jobs, et cetera. And P-TECH is obviously a model of, of putting, flipping that on its head. Um, I've learned to read Zoom cues really well and I can actually tell Greg wants to get in again. <laughs> so Greg, any other non-negotiables before we, before we move forward? It is very similar, which is, what's non-negotiable learning is, is it, it's for all kids. So I'll, we call out, we're eighth grade, we're pre-K through eight. But we call ourselves a college prep elementary school for all kids. And that, and the, and that the, our mission statement, which is provide an academic foundation and ambition to earn a college degree. And this, I guess the last seminar I talked about what is a luxury. No, we think it's a necessity. It's for everyone. Um, and, and, and I guess it's part of the equity is sometimes people say, well, is it for all kids? Yes. Sh show me a wealthy school district in which the expectation is that every kid doesn't go to college. At least it'll be the option. So at least and you'll be fully prepared. So we don't want to, we're not debating whether or not our kids, the expectation is they graduate from high school, they go to college, and they graduate. And that's for all kids. It doesn't matter if you're a diverse learner or if you're a single, you're a single it doesn't matter. All kids. Great. Appreciate you underlining that because I think that in some of the kind of 1980s Vogue tech conversations, there's often sort of the soft bigotry of low expectations being put into this bucket of careers. And you're actually talking about even a higher threshold of expectations for your learners. Um, Ralph, you couldn't have timed this better. We're joined now by Ralph Bland, uh, who's the founder and president of New Paradigm for Education uh, in Detroit and was just putting out a fire drill, but we're here. Uh, so Ralph, I, we're, we're on the question of sort of what are the non-negotiables of a high quality career pathway? Uh, and if any come to mind, uh, would love to hear, hear sort of what that looks like um, in New Paradigm for Education, and then we'll get into some further questions. So uh, good afternoon. Thank you for having me this afternoon. Sorry about the little uh, the, the lateness. Uh, Ralph Bland, New Paradigm for Education. Uh, we impact about 2,500 students in the city of Detroit uh, in the uh, metro area from preschool through 12th grade. Uh, we also have an early college model where we also send students to the University of Michigan to receive dual enrollment credits where those students can graduate and be reclassified when they're entering college as a second semester sophomore or uh, a second, I'm sorry, second semester freshman or a first semester sophomore. Uh, when we talk about, I think, career pathways and what does quality look like, uh, definitely I think it starts with, uh, if we're referring to preschool through eighth grade, I think it starts with field experiences. Uh, I think that's very important. Uh, just to go a little bit more in depth, uh, exposing students to certain uh, content areas where they can expand upon uh, their own creative knowledge. So for an example, like science. Uh, one thing that we did, we created science in a box. So during the pandemic, we were able to send home boxes of science kits where students can work with their families and create different science experiments and also clue in on different videos. So at those early stages, uh, as far in early grades, it definitely sparks the interest. And as that interest grows, uh, students get more exposure and more in depth as they get older. Uh, anywhere from the third to fifth grade, we start students off doing uh, in-depth research projects on areas that they feel passionate about and that's important but also along that way we're also exposing parents to these different career fields that 
students can kind of focus on as they get older so parents can play more of a key part in their uh, progression as they move on. Because uh, I caught the tail end, but uh, I did hear Greg talk about uh, college. Uh, and I think that's very critical because the goal always should be is when I graduate from college, the impact that I can make. Uh, and I definitely uh, agree with Greg on that, even though I came in on the tail end. Uh, as students get these experiences through, and I'll stick with science since I'm using this as the example, they become more interested and then they start to expand on their own knowledge. And then they start to go into, well, I wanna look at this, how was this created? How was this started? Uh, for an example, we had a student in sixth grade after he got more and more involved in the science curriculum, he started to do experiments. Uh, how can I create a degradable uh, lunch tray so we won't have to always throw all these materials away? So this student uh, just went on and when he went to high school, he reached out to a professor at uh, MT, M MIT and wanted to learn more about uh, material science. Uh, this student went on, he went to Michigan, he became a, uh, went in there right in their engineering class, mm -hmm. but his background was so heavy in science that he ended up leading the curb in the engineering class and he started to get internships uh, throughout his college career, working on fighter jets and things of that nature. So I think it all started back with the exposure. And it led him to uh, a career or a path where he can see himself deeply engaged in science at a higher level. So I definitely think uh, it starts early. That's just one example of many on how uh, students can be exposed and, and engaged. I hope I wasn't too long. <laughs> no, that was really helpful, Ralph. And you actually picked up on a couple of strands that your colleagues had named of um, showing students what's possible, not just telling them, right? That this is experiential, this isn't something in a textbook. Uh, in addition to the idea that this starts early and to really unlock long-term options, having high expectations from early on is critical. Um, I also wanna just underline something you called out, which is I think a two-generation approach. Um, you don't often hear family engagement and career pathways in the same conversation, but I think you're pushing us to think about how can family engagement be a key strategy in a career pathway strategy, uh, which feels important. Um, I want to go back to Greg because we just sort of heard Ralph's referendum on why it's important to start early. You know, there's reams of research uh, underlying what Ralph just shared, that early exposure matters immensely to students ambitions, their sense of future possible self. The one statistic from Raj Shetty's research that I always go back to is that affluent students exposed to people working in the innovation economy are 10 times more likely to themselves become inventors than their less affluent peers, controlling for aptitude. So we have a bunch of lower aptitude, high income students uh, operating as inventors in our economy right now, and we're missing all of this latent talent at the bottom distribution of the income quartile, largely because of lack of exposure, not because of lack of talent, right? Um, so I just want to underline the research really tells us exactly what Ralph just laid out. Greg, when you, when you start early on this, uh, for listeners that are maybe working with a K-8 uh, population, what are some best practices? I don't love that term, but what are some things that are working uh, in, in your school network? Sure. Now, I think that, and the reason it's so important, particularly for the first generation, right, college, is that it's going to be so hard for them to get through, right? There's so many hurdles and roadblocks, and they, they've got to really want it, right? They've got to have that fierce ambition. And so what we do is, one, we show them what the world looks like if you get a college degree. They need to experience the joy of living. Um, and they understand that college is about having a better life. Show them how people live. Right? What it means to have freedom and resource in life. It's a different world, right? If, and, and by the way, if you work really hard, you could have all of this. So we expose them to everything. You know, we take you know, camping, you have swimming, you can take them downtown. You can get them outside the neighborhoods. You know what? Let me share a quick story. Like we, uh, we start taking kids to college visits in, in, in middle school. We do a, kid, do a group of kids to Northwest University. And typically, they only, they only take you in high school. We said, no, we got to come earlier, right? We walk kids around. They see the dormitories. 
you know, they see the Starbucks, they're like, this is what I want. Right? You got to show them what they, what they can have if they're really, really willing to work hard at it. And, and so again, they've got, uh, it's really the ambition. That's the hardest piece to instill. Academic foundation, that's easy. But what, getting kids to say, oh, okay, so if I work really hard, I can have this? Absolutely. And here's the pathway to get there. Great, really helpful. Um, I think, so kind of moving up the pipeline here, right? So we have Feet and Rashid are both operating in the high school and into post-secondary space. Uh, obviously Ralph, Ralph as well is in high school. So feel, feel free to chime in here. But um, industry partnerships, another jargon term, right? <laughs> Anytime you talk to an employer, it counts as an industry partnership. But I think they're part and parcel of authentic career pathways. And Fee, you are really, I think, an emblematic of deep intertwined industry partnership in your model. So can you maybe talk about, first give a, a brief description of like just how deep those partnerships are. And for listeners, give some tips on how to forge and maintain those partnerships because it does take a fairly heavy lift on the front end for schools that are just getting into this game. Sure. Um, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with MC Squared, um, we are, like I said at the beginning, we're in Cleveland and we're actually in three locations. I'm sitting at an empty, in an empty classroom right now because my office is in my car. Um, I visit our ninth grade campus, which is located in the Great Lakes Science Center in Cleveland, Ohio. Um, it's, it's open to the public in the Science Center. Um, and actually NASA's um, visitor center is also located in there. So we're working directly with the Science Center and NASA. Um, our 10th grade, we just moved uh, a few weeks ago, actually. We moved to um, Tri-C Manufacturing Campus. So that's a local community college. Um, they have a career pathway for manufacturing and fabrication. We just moved there from um, GE's World Headquarters for Lighting. This was, uh, we were the first school to exist on a Fortune 500 campus. Um, and we would have continued to exist there, but GE is not doing as well as it used to, and they've just moved out of Cleveland. Um, and then our 11th and 12th grade, which is where I'm at now, is at Cleveland State University um, on the campus right here. So we, when we talk about career partnerships or community partnerships, um, that is just a tip of the iceberg, but we consider those place-based partnerships and existing within the fabric of those partnerships. So with our ninth graders being um, with the Great Lakes Science Center and uh, NASA every single day. Um, it's not as simple as someone, someone mentioned also hating the term career days. So I, I hate the term <laughs> career days because I don't think an adult coming and talking at you for 20 minutes about what they do is the best use of time. But we really ingrain students in the fabric of these partnerships. So um, every capstone or project that we design um, is in collaboration with the Great Lakes Science Center and NASA. Our students in starting in ninth grade actually teach a program to seventh graders all over the district. So there's 33,000 students in our district that our ninth graders touch and teach a science experiment to. Um, they work with NASA and they're doing job shadowing and internships at NASA. Um, so that's really we, we always talk about it. So in ninth grade, we want to introduce you to the fun of science and engineering. Um, they design exhibits. They, uh, last year, a traveling exhibit called um, Carnival Curiosity came to town and we designed Carnival of Curiosity Junior, which we designed our own arcade. The kids programmed their video games and they built the actual um, video game systems. So that's in the ninth grade. In the 10th grade, when we were at GE, and now at Tri-C, every student has a mentor one-on-one. Um, -on -one, they work with every uh, once a week. They have lunch with them. Um, they talk through career ideas uh, and then they collaborate on a project. So um, last year it was, they were designing wearable technology in collaboration with GE, utilizing some uh, it, GE lighting products that were new and on the market. Uh, the project was called Remix the Kicks. So all of our students designed a new sneaker um, that had GE lighting built into it and some kind of lighting material in it. Um, and then when we're here at the 11th and 12th grade campus, um, this is on a college campus. It's a four-year college and we truly ingrain the students in the, again, the fabric of the college. Um, 
there are certain things that the rest of our district does, like they require uniforms and they have all these restrictions on what you can eat, like any public school. Um, we take all of those boundaries away because we want students to be seen as a part of the campus and a part of the community. Um, they 100% of our students, nine through 12th grade are taking college classes um, are with the minimum students earning 24 college credits before they graduate high school with us. And it really is every decision that we make is in consultation with our partnerships. So um, it's not as simple as just saying, hey, we're gonna move lunch. It's more, let's talk about what, what's going on on campus that day, what programs we can be a part of. Um, we have students who are members on um, the board at Cleveland State and at the Great Lakes Science Center. Um, we really try to be a part of those communities. Uh, as far as the other partnerships, it's really easy to be a part of a partnership when you live there. Um, but we have other partnerships that come into play too. We have people all the time who come up to us and ask, they're like, I want to help, what can I do? And I've learned from a leadership standpoint, and this is always advice I give to people who are trying to do this, is you have to tell people what they can do. You can't just say, oh, you said you wanted to volunteer, show up and do it. Um, I have kind of a four tiered approach. So if someone says they wanna help, I say, that's great. How much help do you wanna give? Um, do you just want your name on something because we're happy to take a financial donation? Um, do you have a product that you're piloting or you wanna promote because would you be willing to let some of our students work on your design with you? Um, do you have a whole crew of people you wanna bring in? Because if you do, we're working on this project at this time and we could use your help. Or do you want a bigger impact? Do you wanna be up here with the Great Lakes Science Center in Cleveland State? Because if so, let's talk about how you can have a much stronger impact in the school. So people always wanna volunteer and that's great, but they don't necessarily know what to do. So I've learned over the past 15 years now doing this that you have to be willing to tell partners how they can help and not just accept their help. Awesome advice. And I think showing that different people can have different levels of engagement is actually the best way to actually network students into myriad opportunities, right? You're not closing any doors, but you're also not setting up for negative experiences, which is also a downside of poorly designed partnerships. Right. Um, I'm going to plant a seed for the whole panel before I go to Rashid, which is there's a little bit of a debate heating up in the chat around college or career an emphasis on college. So everyone get your wheels turning on sort of how you philosophically and programmatically navigate that. Um, but I wanna turn to Rashid just to give a little bit more airtime and real estate to the P-TECH model because um, another challenge in the career path-based conversation is scale, right? That I think there's a lot of really small scale experiments out there that are really exciting, really making making uh, you know important headway for small groups of students. But P-TECH, like I said, started out serving 100 students. Uh, this is like Rashid himself <laughs> serving 100 students back in 2011. It's now a global model for career advancement. I think it's in 27 countries. I don't know if that's exactly the right number. I think yeah. you have 209 school partners. Um, so I want to sort of understand what drove that scale because it's a little confusing who is demanding career pathways and who is actually able to turn that demand into pathways for students. So, so tell us a little bit about the history and what you see as the, the engine. And so I, I really think it's about being intentional and strategic. You know, when IBM came to the table as the, as the lead partner, it was really about diversity and inclusion and, and being intentional and in creating a scope and sequence with the college partner at that particular time, the early college um, initiative through the City University of New York that already was dealing with early college. We became the 13th early college, but it was really about not just early college, but early industry. And so we needed a scope and sequence that dealt with making sure that students could finish high school, but also making sure that they could gain access to the college pathways early in a pipeline and scope and sequence that included mentorship, um, online learning, the opportunity to leave the building and go into school. And now with, even with remote learning, you know, open P-TECH. And so giving access to students, um, internal as well as external, and trying to make sure that there is alignment in the expectations for learning, in the expectation that skills, if you really want to create a pipeline, you don't just rely on a zip code to 
supply the mentors. You have mentors from the company to go into those zip codes and really help with the diversity and inclusion of all types of learners, not only first generation, but not only ethnicity and gender, but also learning. And so when you're talking about students with disabilities, English language learners, all of those students have a seat at the table of opportunity with Key Tech because that was the intentionality of it. And so when you're talking about meeting with governors specifically of the states, so that way they can help with the legislative process that determines dual enrollment. And so it's really about making sure that, you know, knowing that if you really want replication and scalability, you have to be thinking soup to nuts about how to interact with the different um, constituencies, high school, college, and industry, unions. And, and so we started out um, with the IBM president of the foundation being Stan Littow, who actually had a role as a deputy chancellor of New York City schools. And so coupling with you know, the expectation that the intention was to be better than one school, not just to have a jewel of one school, but to also the same way we went to visit MC Squared and other schools to also open up our learnings for the world and not just to try to paint a, 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 a beautiful picture, but to show that there are challenges, to show that even if a student doesn't come in with the interests of STEM, giving them the early opportunity, you could see that change over time. It's about really um, that intentionality and, and strategy around the design principles, six design principles, and definitely the open access um, and the degree pathways really make the difference. And when you're talking about hiring and giving the opportunity to be first in line for a job opportunity, after you can see the, the end completed, and that becomes incredibly important. And so as we are sitting here today in 2021, there's six states, Colorado, Connecticut, Illinois, Maryland, New York, and Texas, who actually will have P-Tech college graduates. And so um, that's incredible to be able to see that type of completion through the college piece and even going on to industry hires. And so we're happy to be able to have the fruits of the labor um, to be able to show evidence. Many students have gone on to earn four-year degrees. And so it's not college or careers, it's both. It's yeah. skills. What are the skills that are needed to be successful? Even from the industry standpoint, IBM looked at their skills from um, new hires and took those skills to the college and say, these are the skills that we found across new hires in terms of from a technical mm -hmm. standpoint, soft standpoint, how do we make sure the college computer science degree pathways, we can make sure that these skills are aligned. How can we make sure we can introduce those skills in the high school? So that way in the nine to 14 continuum, the student really could have an equivalent of two years of work experience by the industry pipeline. And so time really can look different depending on student who finished a degree in four years, five years or six years, but you have to be intentional and strategic mm -hmm. about design principles and diversity and inclusion and wanting to be able to work with all, all students, all industries, and all educators and families included. It's such a helpful point, Rashid, that I think a lot of times when people talk about scale, it's just about like replication and not actually designing for scale on the front end, that this is actually a model that can serve many, many types of learners, right? And I think that is such a, a provocative point in some ways. And then what I also heard is there's a policy angle to this and that I would argue is sort of heating up in the States right now uh, to, to design better career pathways, but you actually need advocates at the table who can explain what a good career pathway looks like in the moving parts of that. Um, mm -hmm. Great. You, you and definitely need, you need the people who definitely can remove the hurdles. Every state yeah. may define dual enrollment differently. Some states say well, you can't take a college course in grade 10, you can only start in grade 11. And so when you're talking about the economic councils of each state wanting to provide better options for their citizens, then the governor could say, no, this is what we need for 21st century learning. This is what we need to make sure that we can create those pipelines, that we can really have more um, equity in action by making the changes from a policy and legal standpoint that will actually give families and students the best option. And last question there, you obviously have a deep partner in IBM, but are employers lobbying for this? I'm curious, like, is the demand coming from employers and are you leveraging that? <laughs> we've, we've gone from one industry partner to 600 industry partners across the global network. And every company needs to think about their, path, their pipeline and their future. And what better way to increase your diversity and inclusion reality than by partnering early 
yeah. it, um, a, a pipeline that might not look like your typical pipeline of, of your company. And so com everyone wants you know, a pipeline to make sure that they're around for the future. And the best way to do that is to definitely make sure that you can have a hand, not only in designing, but also working with um, the younger population. Awesome. Uh, Greg, I see you want to get in and you also can just interrupt me. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> I hope I'm not a stand and deliver educator like that. <laughs> it's, it's, just, it's, it's a challenge to everyone who's listening as well as the panelists, which is why not be your student's first employer? Meaning, yes, partnerships are great and I love that. But since we're pre-K, when kids graduate eighth grade all the way through college, guess what? We have a summer internship program. And we hire between 60 plus students every year. And they work for us in HR, in finance, in IT, facilities, scene office. But more importantly, guess what the best job is? It's in facilities. What does that mean? You right? We, why? Because they work in facilities. They help them clean the buildings, do the bathrooms, et cetera. Why? Because in life, we think it's important not just to know what you want to do, but know what you don't want to do, right? Mm. I mean, maybe how hard it is. Given the first work, so I, I worked all through, when I was 15 through 21, I worked at Holiday Inn, downtown Baltimore. I worked as a dishwasher, busboy, banquets, et cetera. And it taught me the importance of college, correct? I was clear after that experience. I mean, for six years, you know, disrespected, just like this is a tough work, it's a tough way to make a living. So what, consider, right? It, being the your first employers of the people with your, your students, um, you're much more patient, all right, you're much more loving. You teach them all the unspoken rules. So when they get their first real job, you know they're ready. Um, and but last piece is, you'd be shocked how little social capital our students have. They don't, they, 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 they have a hard time getting a summer job. They really do. And they can count on us. Just one last story. We had a situation where um, a, a well-intentioned well board member spoke to our eighth grade students. We had a nice lunch. And he said, you know, what are you guys doing for the summer? And they mumbled something. He said, well, listen, you want to go home and talk to your fat, talk to your father, and ask him to ask one of his friends to hire you. My board member didn't quite understand that that's not the reality of most of our students, but that's how other communities have that they get the hookup, right? So, point is, consider all of you. What what jobs can you offer your students during a Christmas break? This during a winter break, spring break, summer break. We 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 employ a lot of people, and it's their first job. I love so, that point. Oh, go ahead, Ralph. No, I was just going to say, uh, kind of looping back to Rashid, uh, that he brought up some important points about, uh, number one, we, we have to be intentional. You know, success doesn't happen, you know, by accident, especially at a high level. So uh, it, that's, that's very critical. But I also want to kind of go back to that uh, we have to be intentional with the parents. Uh, and even though some students don't come with the background that we want them to. The parents are sending us their best. So Johnny, they're sending Johnny. They're not peeking around the corner and saying that, well, who else do you have? You know, is this somebody? No, that they, that's Johnny. That's who I have. So I think it's real critical that we be intentional with students. And wherever they are, we have to meet them where they are. And that's uh, being intentional in supporting the parents and even extending resources to those parents that they can even uh, be a better resource for the school. Because at the end of the day, yeah. the parents, we want them to have at least one third of the content knowledge we're trying to give the students so they can support us more in what we're trying to do. And at the end of the day, which is trying to make sure that people have a successful and quality uh, life. So those are just some uh, points I just want that came to my mind right quick. Yeah, I mean, I think you're you're underlining something that uh, there's a very sophisticated conversation about differentiating on the academic front. We don't necessarily talk about meeting students where they're at on the career pathways front. It's a little bit more historically, it's been a little mm -hmm. more kind of pre-designed for the student. And if it fits you, it does. And if you don't fit into it, you don't fit. So I think all of you are illustrating designing with the student at the center of these pathways. One thing I just want to mention, I can't help myself, Greg, on your point of being students first employers, one district out in California that we've been documenting, Cajon Valley, um, even for career exposure, 
has actually leveraged district employees, right? Because a school district or a school system employs attorneys and food service workers, all sorts of employees who can actually share their work experience with students. And that's an asset right in your backyard, just like to Ralph's point, your parents are as well. So I think um, it's, a, it's a prerogative point for districts that are sitting on latent <laughs> relationships and, and social capital that they can use. Okay, so I want to circle back to this uh, college versus career uh, debate in, in the chat. Um, I think it can be a little bit of a false dichotomy, but I think people are still struggling with this in this day and age. So really open to anyone. Oh, Fee, you have your little hand up again. Please interrupt me, guys. But, but would love you guys to help um, audience members sort of think through. Sure. So I put my hand up because I didn't want to talk over anyone. That's all. Um, so I've been paying attention a little bit to this debate, college versus career, and I've definitely heard both sides of it. And, you know, I really philosophically, you know, I believe whatever path you take after high school, um, you can be a good person and a good citizen. You know, that's just kind of my fundamental belief. But Greg said something very interesting um, that the expectation is for all students to go to college. And I think this is really important because I think this is an equity issue as well. Um, if you ever think about or read the articles or even what's presented to us in, in sitcoms and television, um, in an urban environment, uh, the it, it, college versus career is all money driven and how you provide and how you can be traditionally successful. Um, and that is what it typically gets presented. So in, in certain um, districts like mine, which is 100% free and reduced lunch, you know, they're really, what is the difference between college and career? There isn't one because it's just really a case of how are you going to get money and provide for your future. Um, but it's, I think there's a bigger issue around language and how we're presenting this because um, how it is presented to suburban and affluent districts is not about success being money driven. It's about personal fulfillment and giving, um, you know, affluent students, they don't have to think about that success point or that money point. They have to think about what is going to fulfill me as a person? Um, what experience can I explore? So giving students an expectation that all of them should go to college is not a bad thing at all. And uh, getting them to think about and question the difference between college and career is not a bad thing at all. I don't want to take, I don't want my students to believe that their whole life and trajectory is about money making. I want them to believe that they have the same opportunities as everyone to seek personal fulfillment and understand that college is about a lot more than just making money, but it's about meeting new people and having experiences of traveling and getting on campus. Like why, right now, I don't think we're doing a very good job in urban environments, especially of telling students that college is so much more than finding a way to make money. So college versus career doesn't really matter. Um, we wanna build the whole person. Mm. Well, but there's a sense of urgency in some communities that are steeped in generational poverty to where um, if you're not providing um, a legal source of income that's based on college credentials, then students will take a different path. And so we have to be intentional and strategic in talking about education credentials and education credentials as early as possible, because in certain places, there are people comp competing for our children's future. And they're not competing for our children's, children's future with a credential. And we need a stackable credential that for me, that's starting with a two year STEM associate's degree. And so it's college and career, but it's starting as early as humanly possible. Because if not, depending on where you live, the definition of success that's not coupled with an education credential might become the way of life. And that is what we're trying to create a new normal based on success that can be um, equivalent to a longer lifespan because of what you can have access to. And so it becomes incredibly important to understand the skills that are needed in STEM pathways that are not just the old vocational type of reality that we're talking about. 
We're talking about you can go from a two-year STEM degree to a four-year college degree to a master's degree. And so it's important to know this is for all students. It's not just for poor students, it's for rich students. And so when you hear the president talk about free community college for all, free is not enough because poor children may already have access to free college. You need some important mm -hmm. pathways that are focused on degree completion so that way they really have options. Uh, and I will say, sorry, can I just say too, one of the, I think we all believe here on this panel that credentials are important and it's kind of separate from career and college a little bit, but I know at our school, um, we, it is a requirement that every student leaves with a credential before they even head off to college. And I know many, we can build those credentials into our programming to make um, credentialing a non-issue uh, for, for that reason exactly. Uh, you know, being transparent and that uh, the, the majority of uh, the leaders on this call on the panel that uh, we work with a diverse population, we work with uh, and, and mostly African, African-American Black students. So uh, kind of just going back to Rashid's point is that it's important that we establish uh, a foundation for those those students so they'll be able to have a foundation that they can be successful uh, and have the quality of life that they deserve. Uh, so at uh, the, the high school that we, we serve, uh, we promote college graduation. And it's important for us to promote that because the city of Detroit does not have a lot of college graduates and does not have a lot of African-American college graduates coming back, making an impact on their community and also putting their community in a place where they can continue and others can continue to rise from the success. So uh, it's, it's, it's a obligation and responsibility that we're able to put kids in the best situation and they're, be able, and they're able to look at their foundation of education and be able to be able to come back and show that if it's to their family, to their community, because the more students we can get at that higher level that can be in a position to control their life, because that's what we want them to be able to do, control their life and the success that they have is critical. Because Warren, Warren Buffett wants his kids to be successful and go to college. Uh, Bill Gates wants his kids to go to college. So it, it shouldn't be too much to ask that uh, students in poverty or parents in poverty, they want the same thing for their kids. They're just in poverty and kids can't pick their parents. So, you know, we have to do the best that we can. And that's where we go back and say, you know, it, it definitely has to be intentional. I'll editorialize a bit here, which is flipping the college or career on its head, which is that there's also pretty compelling data that a bachelor's degree is the most foolproof ticket to, to economic mobility. And at the same time, there's a lot of underemployed college graduates who are unable to put that degree to work because they don't have career experience or networks in hand. So the power of what you guys are building in my mind, particularly those of you who are emphasizing access to college or even arming students with associate's degrees is that you're actually making it more likely that they convert that degree into a high paying job or into whatever opportunity they want access to. And I actually think that's another place where the career pathways conversation can actually boost outcomes for students who are attending college, but making the most of that degree, not be to uh, fully ignore the point around sort of personal fulfillment, but to say, what are we selling kids when we sell them a college degree? And are we selling them something as foolproof as possible? Also know that the earning potential and, and, and the possibilities to change generation from a two-year STEM degree or a four-year degree. So you, you can't just say any type of four-year degree. Yep. You know, there needs to be an attachment to, yep. to show the reality of how that earning potential can change your life. And particularly for those first generation, those people who come from generations of poverty that we're trying to disrupt. And we have to move faster. So we don't have the luxury of time to say learning is just for the sake of learning and that a college degree should not lead to work. 
Because as I said, there are unfortunate realities in communities, and particularly in the urban reality of which we live, where people are competing for our, the interests of our children to give them careers that are not necessarily in the best interest of our tax paying reality. So there's one last sort of question bubbling up in the chat, which is um, the student debt crisis, particularly for students who complete some, but not all college, right? So they uh, they have put in the time and the dollars, but aren't walking away with the credential that Rashid, to your point, may, if it's the right credential, really be a reliable ticket. Um, obviously, you guys are only some of you are dabbling in the post-secondary space, but thoughts on um, what you can do in career pathway design and in high school or K-8 design to curb that debt crisis, knowing that you don't control what our colleges are doing. <laughs> I think one of the benefits of, of, of COVID is that colleges um, have become scared. They've become, <laughs> they've become frightened and need to find ways to focus on degree attainment. And so many colleges are now looking at those students who definitely fall into those categories who, have, who are close to a degree and trying to bring them back to campus. And so I think that's a bigger conversation that's picking up steam and even trying to use the online format to be able to allow those students who are close to a degree but have not finished. And even looking at some students who are in a four-year degree pathway to see whether or not they could be awarded two-year degrees. So colleges are really paying attention to that type of conversation because a lot of the focus in the past 10 years have been on that conversation of not only degree attainment, but skills that are relevant for the colleges to show that they are working with industry to be able to prepare students for the future. And, so you know, it's one, oh, go ahead, Ralph. It's just, I just wanted to mention that it's one thing because uh, uh, brought up the pandemic and it's, I think it's one thing the pandemic definitely brought out uh, to parents and caregivers that uh, how important quality uh, learning is uh, or overall. Uh, if it's online or if it's face to face, uh, so I think that definitely brought out a, a, a huge concern, and not just in the education community, but of course with parents, uh, our government officials, and etc. So uh, one thing that that that's critical, and when we talk about the means and, and the finances, is that, and I kind of always go back that we have to educate parents as much as we can. Uh, because if, if parents are close, close, if they're close to sitting in the right driver's seat, then we can help. We can help them the rest of the way, but we have to get get them close as we can. And I just that's so critical is that uh, that we continue to do professional development. If it's around finances, on how to get to a college degree and graduate, or if it's how to get to the right career that is, a, is aligned with the person uh, that, that's critical that we involve parents. We have a few minutes here. Fee, Greg, any final thoughts? And I'll wrap us up. I think that um, just to, th I think this bringing this kind of full circle, this is a good place to leverage your partnerships as well. Um, this is an area where we have done that. So, if, in Cleveland, there is a manufacturing shortage right now. So obviously some of the manufacturing agencies want to build a pipeline and want to attract students. And this can be right out of high school. Um, but we also want to make sure that students are not just drawn in by the $18 an hour paycheck thinking like, this is this is it for me. This is perfect for me. So we work with a company locally called Swagelock. And um, what we did was we developed a program where I, I agreed to release um, a cohort of students from school for 11th and 12th grade, two days a week. I worked with the training department there um, to make sure they were incorporating math and engineering into the training so they could actually get math and engineering credit for working an $18 an hour wage job at Swagelock. But I did not want the students um, deterred from the end goal. So I also made it a requirement that if students maintained their position at Swagelock um, after high school, for as long as they were working at Swagelock, they could work part time and Swagelock would fit the bill for their college tuition. So we kind of laid it all out, 
all the way through the end goal. So it gave the student the opportunity to A, learn a skill because now they're all credentialed welders in this manufacturing organization, which they can take anywhere. B, um, they learned our kind of function, project-based learning, STEM, you, STEM isn't everything. So they learned that and we're getting high school credit for that. Um, but see, if they just decide this is not the career path for them, they have an out. They have a way for their partners. Uh, uh, the partnership is agreed to support them all throughout college. So I think there are a lot of organizations out there that want to build a pipeline and you as a leader have to be intentional and you have to, you know, you quid pro quo in the cleanest sense of that word or phrase, you have to, you know, you want our students, we're building you a workforce. I need you to do something for us. Really helpful, tactical example of leveraging partnerships. We are unfortunately at time, so I have to wrap us up. If you guys have additional comments, panelists, please put them in the chat. I, I feel like there's so much wisdom in this Zoom room that we could go another hour. Um, but please, audience, uh, join me in thanking our panelists for carving out this time during an insane time of the school year, during an insane school year. And hopefully this lent some inspiration to those of you thinking about building better career pathways that afford more opportunities for all students, particularly those who have been neglected and left behind for far too long. And thank you again for making the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.